today I'm going to talk about food security from space. When I started working at NASA Goddard 15 years ago, I saw that there are terabytes of information coming out of the Earth Science satellites all over the world. And what we found is that um, we have all this data. And what we need to do is to understand how it will be used for food and food security. So one of the data sets that I am particularly interested in is the vegetation index, which is a information which shows the response of vegetation to changing weather conditions. And you can see in Africa the response to um, the growing season when the rains happen, and in North America when the change of seasons happen. And this data can be extraordinarily useful for understanding food and food production. Food security is the ability of all people to have enough food for an active and healthy life. And I've been studying food security for as long as I've been at Goddard. And for um, a lot of, basically, I've been interested in the topic since I was in the Peace Corps in the early 1990s. And this is a family that I lived with in the Peace Corps. And they are an agricultural family, like many people in the developing world, who farm and eat the food they grow and are very sensitive to variations in the weather. So these folks are, may have problems eating when they do not grow enough food for their families. So the ingredients of food security are availability, which is the ability of the amount of food available in the region where a community lives, access, which is the cost of food and how much it costs compared to the income of the people in the region, and utilization, which is the health of an individual, so their ability to use the, the food that they eat for it to have an active life. So the research that I have been doing is trying to connect availability, as seen by satellites, and the impact of weather shocks, such as droughts and floods and cold periods, on the satellite data and ultimately on food production. So this is basically availability and the cost of food in the markets where those people live. And so it's a big jump. And so I've been working for a long time to try to make a model, which is basically a computer program which uses observations and um, information quantitatively to come up with relationships we can then use to make better decisions. So one of the regions that I look at when I was developing this model is Niger. Niger is in the middle of the continent. It is uh, a West African country. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. The average income is around $400 a year. And 80% of the people who live in Niger are farmers or work in the agriculture sector, moving goods around or selling food in the market. So in this country, we have this guy. He's a farmer. And he's standing in his millet field. He looks sort of like corn. And, and he, agriculture in that region is all done by hand. There's no tractors and not a lot of, of fancy um, uh, technology. And this is a, what the field normally looks like. In 2009, there was a drought when the rains failed to come on time. And it, the field looked like that, very, very dry and empty. So in, if you look at the data from satellites, this is the vegetation image of that same place. And you can see that the brown in the field was reflected in the brown in the satellite imagery. And it wasn't just that field. It was the neighbor, this, this farmer's neighbor's fields, the fields in the states next door, in the countries next door. And so there, there's a, the, the, this drought effect in not just this one community, but all the communities across the continent. And so in coming back to my model, what I wanted to do is to use this information about satellites to estimate, to take the satellite data and estimate food production from the satellite data, and then to connect that food production to interannual changes in prices and monthly food price levels. To do this, we need to understand about how markets work. So markets, obviously, are driven by supply and demand. And so when supply goes down because there's a drought, the, if the people who grow that food are also eating the food they grow, the demand will go up at the same time supply goes down. So this is really different than here in the United States, where if a farmer doesn't produce very much food, the demand doesn't change because the farmer is still eating food from the grocery store, right? In this region, that is not the case. So it's very important to know that you know the, the variations in production. So in my model, what I chose to do is to ignore most of the variables which are important in market functioning. So and there's several reasons for this, but mostly for my model, I just have two input variables. I have the satellite remote sensing from satellites from that, that are as a proxy for local food production, and the international price of, of the same commodity. 
I just have two parameters to estimate local food prices. There are a lot of other things that affect prices in markets, obviously. There's storage, there's trade, there's transport, but we do not have locally specific and readily available comprehensive information on any of these parameters. We, in particularly in the developing regions, we just don't know where food is traded. We don't know what, whether or not people are releasing storage food that's stored or not. This is the kind of storage that they have there. And so I'm going to neglect those variables and try to make my model work with just those two input variables. One of the reasons why I think this might work is because 95% of all food never crosses an international border. It is, most food is grown and eaten locally. We, most people in the world do not participate in this huge trade and transport thing that we do in the United States. They grow food and they eat it, and therefore local production is absolutely critical. And when the local production fails, there are big consequences on food security. Another thing that's really important is that family income is really varies across the world. In, Ni in Niger, in the place that I was, the, that farmer, he spends about 60% of his income on food. In the United States, it's 6.6%. In Europe, it's about 10 to 15%. In India, Pakistan, it's 45 to 50%. Niger is one of the poorest places in the world, so think about trying to eat on $400 a year. I mean, that's, that's about my monthly household budget, you know, or two weeks, you know? So, so one of the reasons why we spend so little on food is because not only is the United States one of the most productive regions, we also tend to eat a lot of very inexpensive, commercially, industrially produced food, which is not very good for us, but it's very inexpensive and very efficiently produced compared to hand cultivation and all the stuff that happens in places like Niger. Another thing to know is when you have one of these big droughts that go across the entire region, you're going to need to buy food to meet the needs of the, of the country. So Niger, if they produce much less food than normal, are going to need to import food from the international market. And that's OK when the international prices are normal. But in 2008 and 2011 and 13, we had 250% of normal, which is a real problem. If you're in Niger and you're trying to come up with enough foreign currency to buy a huge amount of extra food that you weren't expecting because of a weather shock, right? So the variations in the international prices are really important. Another thing you need to have to get food from Kansas to Niger is to have roads that work, roads that don't look like this. We need to have bridges that connect one road to another. We need to have trains which are that work and trucks that are not buses, right? And we need to have ports, which are efficient and connected to the road network. This port is the port of Lagos, Nigeria, and it has a lot of inefficiencies. It has corruption. It is very slow. They have to move the goods from the big containers into sacks, which takes weeks. So there's a very, it's very hard to move goods around in places like Niger. So the infrastructure that connects this farm to a market determines the income of the farmer, and it determines the food security of that community. So high food prices can cause problems, especially when they change really rapidly over a short period of time. And so this is what the map looked like of the places that that very large increase in the international price in 2008. This is it. It's just places that are, it's going to be a problem. But there's no quantitative analysis here. There's no connection of maybe there is a lot of extra production there. Maybe it's really not a problem. So what my work focuses on is trying to put numbers on this map, trying to be more quantitative to allow us to use the satellite data that we have to better understand food security problems. So going back to my model, here we have our, the various elements, right? So we use the satellite data to, that looks at weather shocks to get at food production. And then we have our two parameters, the international prices and last year's production from satellite data to understand monthly food price levels. So now I'm going to show you what the results of this model were for one different, one particular model run, since we do a lot of these model runs. But so one of the big messages from this map is that there are a lot of diverse drivers. So in this map, the gray places are countries are places where I have local food price information. And this map is maize, corn prices. And in the red dots, they're places where the, the local weather shocks are seen by satellite remote sensing. And the international price are both important for understanding and 
figuring out what the next month's price in these local places are. The yellow dots are places where these two parameters are not important. And we can see that, for example, if you're in Mozambique, you may or may not be affected by these things. It's really various. And one of the re you know, this makes a lot of sense. Think about New York and Detroit. They're both in the United States, but they're extraordinarily different economies. One is on the Atlantic Ocean. They have totally different wage labor. They have do different things. They have completely different road networks. They have different histories. Everything is different. And the same thing goes for developing regions, too. Some places are well connected to the local agricultural system. Other places are not. So how can we use this information to improve our understanding of food security problems? Because just having a model doesn't mean it will do anything. So one of the ways I'm interested in using this is to make try to group markets into different drivers. So in this topology, we have places where domestic weather shocks influence prices and places where they have no effect. And then here we have global prices have no effect and global prices influence the local price. This, and so in this first, that map I just showed you is this bottom right quadrant here where, um, where both of these things are important. And this is, these are places that are food surplus area in an exporting country where we have, um, which are urban, well-connected. So you can think about a place like Dakar, Senegal, which is on the Atlantic Ocean. It has a lot of other sources of income. It still is a very agricultural country. So when they have a big drought, the broader economy is affected. So those places are affected both by the int large international changes in prices and also by local weather shocks. In this next grouping, we can see that global prices dominate. The, so if you're using the remote sensing information and you see a big drought, it makes no difference really for local weather, local food prices. So think this is like Panama City, Panama, right? It's on the canal, huge amounts of international trade. Most of the people who live in Panama live in Panama City. It's a tiny little country, really big city. So in that place, when you have a huge change, like we saw in 2008, of the international prices going up 250% in five months, need to pay attention to those places which are mostly dominated by international prices. The poor people in those places will be really affected by those big changes, even if they aren't actually eating the food that came from the international market. It's just everyone goes, ah, and, they, and then change the local prices. And then you have a food security problem. So this next one is our friend in Niger, right? It's in the middle of the continent of Africa, so far from the international markets that Local weather shocks dominate the local prices. They are isolated, landlocked, high poverty, food surplus area, right? And so when they have a big drought, not only will they not have enough food that they own produce, but it's darn hard, remember those roads, to move goods from Kansas to the middle of Niger because there's just so many impediments. And this last quadrant, in my opinion, is super interesting is places that my two parameter model does not work very well. The, naive, the, the model will work better without those two parameters. And those are places where all the other things that affect markets are important. Think of it, you know, the policies, the economy, the politics, the, you know, the storage, the trade, 50 things that I have not in my model are important here. And so to get at these places, we need better data. We need better information. We need diagnosis. There's all sorts of things that we need that we won't have. So this is where I'm going to spend the next 15 years looking and, so, and working. And also, they will moderate the effects of these other parameters. right? So how can we use this information? Right now, satellite data is used to look at what's going on in Niger. And local food price data is used to what's going on in Niger. What we don't know is what are the interactions of those two. So we're hoping to work with organizations like the Famine Early Warning Systems Network to better connect the, these two parameters and their interactions to improve response during times of need, like our 2009 drought. When all those people are hungry, we need to be able to respond effectively and not bring aid when it's not needed, but bring effective aid when it is. So finally, before I end, I wanted to say a word about climate change. Climate change is likely to continue to impact the amount of shocks, weather shocks, that we are going to see. We're likely to see more droughts, more floods, more weird weather. And that weather will have 
direct impact on people's ability to feed themselves and their children. And it's unfortunate, but the people who are most guilty of making emissions, which are causing the changes in climate, which are these red countries here, are the ones that are least vulnerable to those changes, the green countries on the bottom. The ones most vulnerable, the red countries on the bottom, are the ones who had the least cause, have, have the lowest emissions today. And so as we go forward, we need to be sensitive and we need to provide help when it's asked for so that everyone in the world can eat and be food secure. This is written up in my book, which is um, coming out in May. So if you want to learn more, you can see, look at it then. Thank you.